Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm going to start off with a real-life horror story. Um, this gentleman's name was Liam Ewens, um, and he once said um, on his blog that it's actually obscene what you can find out about people on the internet. Uh, Ewens, on the 15th of October 1999, um, had not had any contact with this young girl, Amy Boyens, uh, since primary school, but had developed some kind of obsession with her and decided for some reason that he needed to kill her and her family. He waited outside her parking lot, in the parking lot of her place of employment, and when she got to her car, she repeatedly, he repeatedly shot her with his handgun um, and eventually turned the gun on himself and killed himself. What is particularly interesting is how he managed to locate her, because since primary school he had lost contact with her completely, um, but had this obsession, and he managed to use the internet to find out all of her personal information. Um, a company called DocuSearch gave him her social security number for $45, and if you know anything about the States, you know the social security number pretty much gives you access to most things. And he also managed to get hold of her home address and her work details, um, an employee of DocuSearch pretended to be uh, someone working for an insurance company and called to verify details, and for that service they charged him $119. And on a website that he had created a few months before her murder, he openly fantasized about killing her and her family, promising to shoot her outside of her workplace. The scary thing is it shows just how dangerous um, it can be if we don't protect private information. Ethical issues related to technology-driven medical practice mainly center around the issue of confidentiality of patients' private information. Of course, there are other issues, um, but I'm going to confine myself in this talk just to confidentiality. And as you know, confidentiality is a long-established ethical norm in the practice of medicine. It applies to the whole of a patient's encounter with healthcare providers from the confidentiality of the appointment book itself through to not divulging information of patients' treatment or condition to others without their consent, through thoughtless gossip about patients, etc. And the basic principle here is that patients provide healthcare providers with their personal information not because they choose to or want to, but because they have to in order to be able to be treated. And patients then are entitled to expect that healthcare providers will take reasonable measures to ensure that their personal information is protected. So then why in the first place should we ensure confidentiality? So I'm going to ask you to do a bit of work and let's see what you know already. Why should we ensure patient confidentiality? Any ideas? Anyone? One reason? Okay. I don't know why I did this because I can't read it either. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> Any other reasons? To prevent discrimination. Any others? Respect. Good one. Those of you who are members of, of the health professions, you belong to the HPCSA. Um, why else? Because the ethical guidelines that tell you to, not so. Okay, well, we'll see how well you do. <laughs> Let me give you some reasons. Well, one of the very first reasons is that confidentiality is required by the law. Um, if you have a look at the Bill of Rights in the Constitution, uh, Article 14 says everyone has the right to privacy. And that right to privacy, as you will know, is backed up by international human rights agreements that have been ratified by the state as well. In the National Health Act, um, it says that all information about a user is confidential, their health status, treatment, their stay in hospital, and information may only be disclosed with the user's consent um, where, that has been given in writing or where there is a court order or where the law requires disclosure um, or where non-disclosure would result in a threat to public health. 
The National Health Act also says of patient records that you must set up control measures to prevent unauthorized access to these records and the protection of records includes, for example, not tampering, destroying or falsifying information, copying information or gaining access without authority. So Brenda, those of your people who were, um, again, had not followed the rules um, were actually not also acting against the law. And otherwise, the person commits an offence and is liable to a conviction um, and a fine, etc. Another reason is that confidentiality is a professional ethical requirement. Um, the HPCSA book line t booklet 10, uh, which deals mainly with this sort of stuff, uh, says that a practi practitioner can only divulge verbally or in writing information regarding a patient um, when it is in terms of a statutory provision at the instruction of a court of law or where it is justified in the public interest. Any other information, obviously, you need to get permission of the patient to divulge um, and where the patient themselves has given permission in some sort of way. But I think we all know and realize from Brenda's results um, and from what we know about people generally that just adherence to the law and ethical requirements is not going to be enough. If we want healthcare professionals to obey the law and to follow ethical rules, then I think we will be well served if we give them deeper reasons for why they should. Moral formation cannot be achieved only through telling people what their legal and ethical responsibilities are. And one way in which we can achieve buy-in is to provide good, convincing reasons for why people ought to fulfill these responsibilities in the first place. Often people do not fulfill their ethical responsibilities because they've never really thought about it. Um, they've never really thought about why they should. So I'm going to try in the next little while to convince you that we have a moral obligation to respect patients' privacy and to ensure their confidentiality. These days, one of the most common reasons people will generally give if you ask them why we should uphold confidentiality is that patients have a right to privacy. That's a nice answer. It appeals to most people. It's supported by human rights declarations and the Constitution, and it has quite persuasive power. People often see rights as kind of trump cards. It's my right, and that's the end of the matter. But with claims, claim rights, like the right to privacy, there is a corresponding obligation on somebody else not to infringe that right. And so when I say that I have a right to privacy, I'm essentially saying that I'm entitled to expect other people to agree to upholding that right. So when I claim a right to something, I also claim that someone else owes me something. For me to make that claim then, I need to have some very good reasons for doing so. so we've become so used to these claims that I think we often don't really question them. By virtue of exactly what do we have such a right in the first place? So we hear things like, I have a right to practice my culture, including female genital mutilation. I have a right to beat my wife if she is disrespectful. I have a right to refuse a blood transfusion for my child. And even, Dad, I have a right to go on the school tour even if you can't afford it. And what these examples show is that just claiming a right is not sufficient. Rights themselves need some kind of moral grounding. Furthermore, we've only been using this language of human rights for a few hundred years, and we're still busy arguing about exactly what things should count as rights and what things should not. Not that long ago, most people of our species sincerely believed that the right to freedom applied to white landowners, certainly not to serfs, peasants, or Negroes, as they would have called them in those days. And for a long while, societies didn't even think that women had rights. Arguably, there's still some today who think that way. So how do we actually know what is a right in the first place? And where do these rights come from? Why should we respect them as somehow being authoritative? Did they fall from the sky into the hands of a sand clansman like a Coke bottle? Were these rights revealed to us on stone tablets or gold plates? No. The fact of the matter is that most people have never really thought about it. We've never actually thought about what grounds rights. We simply say, well, it's a right, so I am entitled to it. So if we're going to respect people's rights, then I think we actually need to have more solid reasons for doing so. So still we need to ask, 
What gives a patient a right to privacy and a healthcare professional a duty to uphold the patient's confidentiality? By virtue of exactly what does a patient have such a right in the first place? So if I'm going to achieve my aim of convincing you that patients do have a right to confidentiality, I'm going to have to offer just a little bit more than the claim that it is a right. I'm going to have to dig a little deeper. So a second common reason that people often give for respecting privacy is the golden rule. Many of us would say that we should respect privacy because we would want others to do the same for us. An interesting thing about the golden rule is that this idea that we should treat others as we would like to be treated is pretty widespread across most cultures and most religions. Most groups seem to have some concept of something similar to this golden rule. So it seems to be a very basic kind of intrinsic understanding of morality and it certainly is per pervasive enough for us to say that it is part of the common morality something that is shared by so many people across the worlds and groups that it is something that we should consider seriously. But, although it's a good general principle, it doesn't give us specific reasons for why privacy in particular is something that ought to be respected. So again, we're going to have to dig just a little deeper. Another reason that is often given for why we should protect privacy comes from the principle of non-maleficence. And many agree with the idea that we ought not to do avoidable things that will cause harm to others. And there's a long established ethical tradition, as you know, in medical practice, that you should first do no harm. And again, this is very much part of the common morality. It's shared by most religions and cultures, not ensuring people's privacy can indeed harm them, as Amy Boyer's story shows. So, let me ask you, this is your field, not mine, in what ways can breaches of confidentiality cause harm in healthcare practice? How can breaching confidentiality harm your patient? certain sensitive information could get to an employer and it could impact on you in some sort of way. Who else might get that sort of information? Maybe. Sorry? Family might find out. So a family member might find out something about someone's health status that they didn't want them to know. It could result in all kinds of things. Young, young girls often end up being beaten by fathers because they find out they're pregnant, for instance, that sort of thing. And worse harms can happen than that. <laughs> I just recently found out that the credit regulator also can have access to our medical information. And then it means it can, they can decide not to fund you or give you a loan on based on your income. So financial institutions, for instance, if they found out about someone's health status, they might not give them a loan or whatever. Okay. Societal discrimination. Sorry? Societal discrimination. Societal discrimination. People experience stigma as a result of having certain kinds of conditions, etc. So it goes on and on, and there are many kinds of ways in which people can be harmed as a result of it. But the problem with the principle of non-maleficence is that it seems to impose a duty of confidentiality only to the extent that a breach has the potential to cause harm. And this makes it seem as though we don't have to respect confidentiality where it would not cause harm to others. So sharing photos of a patient's disfigured body on Facebook or via email would then on this account not seem to be morally wrong if there was no way for the patient to be identified. Because it could be argued that it can't actually harm that patient particularly. So the smaller the chance of harm and the less serious the potential of harm, the less onerous the obligation seems to be on us to uphold confidentiality. Yet somehow that just doesn't seem to be right. Applying the principle of non-maleficence alone does not seem to be enough, because it would only really require us to uphold confidentiality in cases where reasonably serious harms could result from a breach. So non-maleficence is a good reason for ensuring confidentiality, but again is not enough to do all of the work. So possibly a more robust way, a reason for respecting confidentiality is based on the idea that persons have some kind of basic dignity that ought to be respected. And the German philosopher Immanuel Kant 
is probably the most well-known uh, proponent of this idea. And he says that what makes persons different from other animals is our ability to reason. Our rationality, he says, means that we are able to be autonomous and self-directed, capable of independent choice. And with this ability goes the ability to be moral agents, to make our own choices about our actions, to be able to discern between what is morally right and wrong. And these capabilities set us apart from other creatures and require that we should treat one another with a certain degree of basic respect. And in particular for Kant, this entails that we should not treat others just as means, but we should always respect them as ends in themselves, or to put that in ordinary English, we should accord to them a basic inherent dignity, a dignity that they have solely on the grounds that they are rational, autonomous human beings. Now clearly Kant's notion of respect for persons is secular, it's based entirely on what people are capable of and not on any religious ideas, but it is supported by many faith-based notions that say similar sorts of things. For instance, the Judeo-Christian idea that all persons are created in the image of God, and this confers on them a basic dignity. Or notions that persons have a soul, or perhaps a spirit or a life force, something that also grants persons a special degree of dignity. So there is widespread agreement on the idea that persons have inherent dignity that should be respected, and this is a very good reason, then, for why we should uphold their confidentiality, because respecting patients entails respecting their choices about who knows their personal information. Another powerful reason for respecting confidentiality is found in the idea of the so-called social contract. And the basic idea is that what is morally right or wrong is essentially based on assumed unwritten contract between members of society. What is moral is what most rational people would agree to. Well, it seems kind of rational that most moral people would agree to the idea that people's private information should be protected as far as possible. And moreover, social contract theory also helps to give meaning to the idea of human rights. I said earlier that rights need further justification. Well, something can only be called a right if it is an entitlement that most rational people would agree to. And together with the principle of respect for persons, social contract theory gives us some very solid grounds for thinking that people do indeed have a right to privacy. It is likely that most rational people would be happy to agree to such a right, and upholding such a right respects the choices of autonomous patients with respect to who knows what about them. The idea of the social contract is also helpful in another way. Because some might question whether there's anything wrong with sharing people's private information, photos, images, other information, if it has been anonymized. If a radiographer SMSs images of a patient to friends where there is no identifying information, would this still be morally wrong? The notion of the social contract helps us to answer this question because it is also used in the field of professional ethics. And the idea here goes something like this. On one side of the social contract, society grants to the professions quite a lot of autonomy in terms of their practice and their training and the regulation and discipline of their members. And on the other side of the contract, society expects professionals to be committed to some basic ethical standards and principles including that of confidentiality. And this idea of the contract is essentially the basis of trust in the profession. Since patients need to trust professionals with their health and their information, it is assumed that professionals are committed to upholding ethical standard. And as we know, the doctor-patient relationship requires trust to be able to work at all. So sharing or publishing even anonymized information about patients could seriously damage this relationship of trust, and it would be a betrayal of the social contract between society and the profession. So why should we ensure confidentiality? Firstly, it's a legal requirement. Secondly, it's a professional ethical requirement. And then digging more deeply into terms, deeply into terms of moral reasons why, because of the right to privacy, because of the golden rule, because of the principle of non-maleficence or not harming others, because we ought to respect persons 
and because of the social contract and its implications. So I hope I've managed to convince you that there are some good reasons for thinking that we do have a moral obligation to ensure that private information of our patients is kept confidential. I want to move on quickly to some more specific questions about threats to confidentiality in technology-driven medicine. And it seems to me that there are two main threats to confidentiality specifically related to technology. The first is the threats to confidentiality that are inherent in, syst inherent in systems, software and organizational. And the second is the threats to confidentiality that arise as a result of the behavior of healthcare personnel. As the Amy Boyer's case shows, personal information in electronic form is vulnerable to being illegally accessed. I am skeptical about the possibility that we will ever have 100% effective means of protecting data. But the fact is, we are only morally obliged to do that that we can do. We can't be morally obliged to do things that we can't do. And what we can do is that we can ensure that we have the best data security possible in order to try to protect our patients' details. And to achieve this requires broad compliance by individual practitioners and hospitals, other medical care facilities. I think Brenda's study has shown that this is currently probably not really happening to the extent that it should, um, but I'm confident that this is going to change. The existing requirements of the law and the HPCSA guidelines in this regard are about to be enormously strengthened by a new law. This law is called the Protection of Personal Information Act, commonly known in our circles as POPI. Um, and POPI is about to be implemented and, and has been signed into law by the President, um, but there's a period of time which is being allowed for individuals and organizations to become compliant. Uh, so one of the questions we might ask, well, how is this new act going to impact upon those in healthcare? And I'm going to rely particularly on a document prepared by the Medical Protection Society, which summarizes some of the aspects of this act that are going to be applicable. And firstly, Poppy says that personal information may only be collected for the specific purpose of providing services to a particular subject. Any personal information you hold must be protected from loss, damage, or unauthorized destruction and unlawful access. You should implement reasonable technical and organizational measures to ensure this. However, the resources of your organization will be taken into account, as well as the nature of the information when determining what these reasonable measures are. Note, by the way, that an organization, it will, an ordinary medical practice, for instance, would count um, as an organization in this sense. As a minimum, doctors are expected to identify all reasonable and foreseeable internal and external risks establish appropriate safeguards and regularly review these. And MPS recommends you carry out a risk assessment and draw up a protocol. Some of the examples of foreseeable risk in the Act, um, employees requiring access to patient information should be identified and should have employment agreements that include a clause to keep information strictly confidential. Employees should have individual passwords to access patient information which are updated from time to time. A generic password for all staff is not acceptable. And then other foreseeable risks, accidental destruction, hard drive crashes, etc., ensure suitable backup um, in order to limit or prevent this. And theft, ensure hard copies are stored securely in locked filing cabinets or rooms, and patient files should never be left unattended. Poppy also talks about disclosures to third parties. Um, it confirms very much the conditions that are already established uh, by the HPCSA in Booklet 10, um, the conditions under which disclosures can be made without consent, namely where there's a threat to public health or there's statutory requirements, for instance, the reporting of notifiable diseases, um, etc. And generally, it is expected that patients will be informed that their information may be shared with other members of the health team where it is necessary for their treatment or management, um, but such sharing is legitimate as long as patients have been informed beforehand that that is standard practice. And Poppy also supports the HPCSA guidelines about the use of data for education and training and the publication of data or images, and um, it basically gives exactly the same kinds 
um, of advice. Poppy also imposes on the healthcare provider a duty to ensure that their software systems, their data security and staff training and supervision are reasonable in terms of providing adequate protection. These will all be legal and enforceable requirements. And so it's going to simply become increasingly difficult to get away with a sloppy approach to data security and to the protection of confidentiality. Basically what this act will do is give teeth to the existing guidelines that we already have. And just to so show you how big these teeth are, failures to comply can lead to complaints to the information regulator, civil claims for damages, and by the way, the information regulator will assist people to bring these claims uh, before the courts, and prosecution with a fine of up to 10 million rand or prison sentence of a maximum of 10 years or both. So that's my claim that I think the problem with compliance requirements to protect information related to systems will mainly be sorted out by means of the law. There are not very many carrots here, but there is a very, very big stick. My big worry, though, is about the other great source of risk, and that is healthcare personnel themselves. Many of the most worrying risks that are associated with the non-protection of patient data lay with the potential for practitioners, students, administrative staff, other personnel to intentionally or unintentionally pass private information onto others or allow that to happen. And the reason that it is so worrying is because it has the potential to really harm the basic relationship of trusts that patients have with the profession. It's also incredibly difficult to manage and it's inc because no one has real control over it and essentially what we need to do is we need to get people to change their way of thinking and to change their behavior. And as you know, that is not very easy. Unfortunately, just knowing what we ought to do does not guarantee that we'll do it. And even when we are completely convinced that we ought to act in a particular way, we are human and we are prone to making the wrong choices. A recent study in KZN looked at the sex education component of the compulsory subject of life orientation in schools. And it suggested that even though the quality of instruction was good, students generally seemed to master the knowledge, in fact most of them got very, very high marks, it did not impact on their behavior. Despite knowing the risks of unsafe sex, students still engaged in risky sexual activities. And in this case, their own health was at risk, and they still did not show changed sensible behaviors based on knowledge. And when it comes to confidentiality, the risk of harm is primarily to someone else, the patient. So if knowing what is right does not ensure that people do what is right for their own sake, how much less is it going to ensure that they do it for the sake of others? So now I'm required to venture into territory that really is not in my area of expertise. And that's to ask the question, well, how do we get people to act in accordance with ethical obligations? Clearly, just teaching people what their obligations are is not enough. And even more of a challenge is I suspect that most breaches are more a matter of thoughtlessness than deliberate attempts to cause harm. So the challenge seems to be formidable. I think the first thing that we can do is we can do what I tried to do earlier, and that is to use persuasion to convince people that they really ought to act in a certain way. And what this requires is giving the teaching of ethics a lot more prominence than is currently the case. The second thing that we can do is to introduce sanctions, punishments for non-compliance. And I think with Poppy this is being done, at least to, at a structural and managerial level quite well, and once it is fully implemented, um, a lot of that will be sorted out. But the other thing that we can do the most difficult thing, but the most important, I think, is that we have to change organizational culture. It has to become a matter of personal pride in oneself as a healthcare provider that one of the things that you are committed to is protecting private information. And this will not be achieved with a few ethics lectures during training and a couple of ethics CPD events each year. The entire group culture of healthcare organizations needs to change in a way that every member of staff feels a strong,
personal commitment to maintaining patient confidentiality. Those companies that have developed a reputation for excellent service manage it by making that commitment to customer satisfaction something that every member of staff is personally committed to. Now there's no easy way to achieve this and it's going to take lots of constant reminders but let me leave you with just some ideas. Firstly, perhaps what we should do is get all staff members to sign a pledge that they will follow procedures and respect confidentiality before they are allocated passwords. Secondly, well, it wouldn't be very good, I don't think, to put up signs everywhere reminding people to protect people's confidenti confidentiality if the patients would see that. Um, that would sort of see, seem to be a little bit counterproductive. But we could get creative about it. We could ensure that people have screensavers uh, with messages or login screens with messages that support confidentiality. Our patients' information belongs to them and no one else. A good radiographer keeps patient information confidential. Thirdly, I think there need to be consequences for every breach, no matter how small. No matter how small a breach of confidentiality is, there needs to be some disciplinary action taken. Thirdly, I'd like to recommend that we consider whether it would be possible to allow for a more serious stick, and that is for summary dismissal in the case of serious breaches. It seems that, from what I understand about our labor law, summary dismissal is allowed for non-trivial violations of reasonable expectations of people in a particular job, and it is reasonable to expect those in healthcare to respect the confidentiality of their patients. And then, I recommend repeated ethics training. They'll keep me in business. Um, <laughs> and I'd like you to think about some others, and maybe we can discuss that during the time we have for questions. I'd like to end with just a quick story. I was in the UK about 10 years ago. I was doing some business for a company there, um, and they needed to send me some stuff back to South Africa. So I said to them, well, how are you going to get it to me? And they said, we'll post it to you. And I looked at them. I said, do you know anything about the South African Post Office? Um, and they said, no. I said, well, you know, things get lost, post gets thrown away, sometimes it can take six months to arrive, sometimes it just never arrives at all. And this person I was talking to was absolutely horrified. It was just unbelievable to her that it was possible to have a postal service like that. And she said, you know, we call our postal service the Royal Mail. And she said, the Royal Mail guarantees that an article, any article, will be delivered overnight to, from any one part of this country to any other part of this country in the standard mail. Okay? Guaranteed. And the reason is because it's the Royal Mail. Every article of post belongs to the Queen herself. While it is in transit, it belongs to the Queen. That's the attitude that they have to the post. We need to de develop that kind of attitude to the confidential information of our patients. Thank you.